You're listening to Conferences on Line Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is August 11, 2017, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, flow cytometry and the diagnosis of primary immunodeficiency. Our presenter is Dr. James Verbsky. He's an associate professor of pediatrics at the Medical College of Wisconsin in Madison, Wisconsin. So um, today we're talking about flow cytometry, and I'm going to bore you with about 10 slides of the theory, theoretical of flow cytometry. Um, I know a lot of you will order it, so it's probably nice to know how it's done. Uh, and then we'll do some uh, cases where it's, I find it very diagnostic and helpful, and then cases where it's kind of helpful. <laughs> so, and maybe a couple pitfalls in flow. So, all right. Um, these are learning objectives. So flow cytometry is defined as basically a manner to study particles as they flow through a fluid stream. That's why it's called flow cytometry. Um, you can actually study any size particle, uh, nanobeads, tiny particles, to big tumors, or even bigger things. As long as it goes through the uh, uh, goes through the tubing, you can study it. Um, but we typically use it most for cell analysis, and we pair it with uh, um, fluorescently labeled antibodies is the most common way, but that's not the only way you can do flow cytometry. There's actually newer technologies where they use uh, high molecular weight uh, metals conjugated to antibodies, and they use mass spectroscopy in the flow cytometry machine. Um, we won't talk about that because it's incredibly expensive and only a couple centers do it, but there are some advantages to it. So uh, what is it exactly in a nutshell? Uh, you stain cells with usually monoclonal antibodies that are specific to a certain target. Uh, the antibodies are labeled with uh, fluorochromes, which are just fluorescent molecules. Um, they're run through, and then they go through very fast one cell at a time. A laser shines a light on the fluorochrome. Uh, and um, it's important to remember the different different types of molecules stimulate at different wavelengths and emit at different wavelengths. Uh, wavelengths. So that's why we can, we can do up to 10, 12, 15 colors at a time, depending on the number of la lasers and the number of filters and that kind of stuff. So um, one of the first things we get from a flow cytometer is uh, based on light scatter. And the, there's an example in the up, upper right-hand corner. As the laser hits it, the cell blocks some forward light that's just based on size. And then depending on the granularity of the cell, uh, it'll uh, scatter light to the side. That's called side scatter. So if you look at the bottom right corner, if you take forward plot forward by side scatter, each dot on that plot is a cell. You'll see a number of different populations. Uh, the smallest populations are lymphocytes. Actually, to the left of lymphocytes, there's a little shadow those would be where the red blood cells are. Um, this is these. This blood has been lysed, so there aren't many red blood cells. But um, I like I tell people if you think about hematology when you're looking at differentials, the lymphocytes were just a little bigger than the red cells. That makes sense. Monocytes are a little bigger, and then neutrophils are big also. But monocytes and neutrophils are more granular, so you'll see that the neutrophils are up in the top right corner. Monocytes are in between. Um, as allergists, you will sometimes see eosinophils. Uh, I guess, can you guys see my pointer? Yes. The eosinophils are way up here. We don't even we don't even uh, keep them in the plot because they're so granular. So, but sometimes you'll see this population in someone who has a peripheral eosinophilia. So, this is very basic for uh, size and uh, size and granularity. This is a lot on how they do automated uh, CBCs, or that's how they used to do it. So then. Um, basically, we have tons of fluorescent compounds, and each fluorescent compound has a stimulation wavelength and an emission wavelength. So um, these are some common co compounds like FITC, PE, APC. So for example, if you're going to stimulate, say you, you stained a cell with all four colors. Um, if you stimulate with a wa wavelength, this is a 488 laser, you'll stimulate FITC, but you won't stimulate APC. That makes it very clean because you're only stimulating one molecule. Um, 
Uh, now, if you're stimulating FITSI and PE, you see they both stimulate at the same time, so you have to be careful that when they emit, they're at different wavelengths. So um, uh, that's kind of the basis on the lasers, and now we have four, five, six color, six laser machines they, just based on wavelength. And then you'll see that usually the molecules emit at a higher, uh, higher wavelength than stimulated, so FITSI uh, emits here, PITS, uh, PE is here, APC is way over here. And then we have filters that will pick up the different wavelengths and tell you how much light is emitted. So, uh, I don't want to go too much on this, but you can do, you know, cut out certain wavelengths you don't want to mess with, depending on the uh, different lasers. You can have cut a lower wavelength, higher wavelengths, or in-between wavelengths. And then you get something like this, which is very confusing, but you have the laser you have all the filter, you have all of the filters, and then you have the sensors, and then it gives you essentially light emitted for each wavelength. Um, I always stress this because uh, if you ever see flow cytometry in a paper, for example, and you're reviewing it, there's a couple. One thing you have to know about um, using flow cytometry for fluorescence um, is something called compensation, as you can see here. These things are not perfect in that when you, uh, the FITSI uh, probe uh, emits, and this is your typical filter in between here, but you see it actually emits all the way down into the higher uh, wavelengths. So then um, that can cause a problem when you're getting, uh, you're measuring this. If you're looking at the PE filter, it'll also stimulate a little bit. So, and I'll show you what that looks like, but you, there's a lot of times you'll see in papers that people will say something is stained and it's not really stained, it's just they didn't compensate correctly and it's just something you should be aware of. Um, and the way we do this is pretty simple, is you just, you have to stain one color at a time and then you have to uh, basically just subtract this uh, signal away from the PE so that you know what's PE and what's 50. So if that's not done correctly, people will make conclusions based on poor staining and it's a, an important thing. So this is what happens. So um, this is stained with one color, PE. When you stain with one color, it should only go in one direction. But as you can see, you're getting staining in the other direction. That's because PE overlaps with um, PE emits light into this uh, this filter, this uh, um, wavelength, uh, this fluorochrome's filter. And it's, you'll always notice this is the higher the emission, the more it goes up. So it's always a curve up this way or a curve up that way. If you see that in the paper, be suspicious that um, that somebody didn't compensate correctly and they could be making conclusions on something that's just artifactual. Similarly, if you if you uh, change, you can do this on the machine. If you just, if you subtract too much, you drive it down and you'll see the signal is now down here on the uh, axis. And sometimes they can drive it all the way down so it disappears. So you always have to be a little careful when you in interpret stuff. But uh, a perfectly compensated color is like this. It stays in one, uh, one direction. It's, it's absolutely uh, horizontal here and that tells you it's been compensated correctly. So you probably won't deal with this much, but if you see these kind of things um, uh, on papers and stuff, it's just a little hint to say maybe they did something technically wrong. The other thing you should be very careful if you see something cut off where, you know, everything's a population. It's typ typically, you know, it's dense in the middle and then it spreads out. If you see a line cut through it where it just becomes uh, flat, I don't have a good example, but just imagine there's a line here, you don't see anything to the right. That means someone applied a filter that's cutting out a population. You should be suspicious that they're not showing you all the data. And that's actually very easy to do. And you can cheat quite a bit on your data on flow cytometry. So, um, but what do we typically get once it's compensated? Um, this is the plot we typically get. This would be a, here's a typical uh, looking at CD4 and CD8, uh, staining for CD8 cells and CD3 cells. First thing you do is you look at the forward site scatter, and obviously we want to look at lymphocytes for CD3 and CD8. You really don't want to look at monocytes or neutrophils. That doesn't make a lot of sense. So we put a gate around this and apply it. And then you can see here you should have, when you stain with two colors, you should really have four populations. You shouldn't see any curving, which would indicate compensation. So this looks pretty good. So these are all CD3 cells. So these are CD3, CD8 double positives, and then the negatives are typically obviously CD4 cells. And of course, some NK T cells could be in there because you're not staining with CD4. So that's typically what I look at when they hand me the reports for clinical flow. Look at all the staining, be sure it looks good. Uh, 
be sure there's nothing funny about it. Um, uh, I mentioned gating quickly. I'm sorry, this is a really, I couldn't find a good example. Um, it's a horrible uh, quality picture, but this is ungated. You see those four populations, and then you see this. It's probably either dead cells or monocytes, because they um, um, like the stain stuff. Uh, actually, this is more likely dead cells, but you notice this population here uh, are positive. Um, if you then gate on the lymphocytes, which we're doing here, you see this population disappears quite a bit, and this population is gone. These are monocytes, which are known to stain for CD4. So this is an example where you can really get a very different picture if you gate or do not gate. It's always a good idea when you're doing your own flow to move this gate around and see what else is staining, uh, just so you know what's in there. Anyway, you probably won't have to deal with much of that, but that's just a couple of things you, you might run across. So when we, this is our typical layout, um, and uh, here, here's the data is presented down here. Sorry, it's not great quality, but what it gives you is the percentages in each quadrant, as well as what's called the mean fluorescent intensity. Uh, the mean fluorescent intensity just tells you how much it shifted. So this is a logarithmic scale. This is 100, that's 1,000. So the MFI for CD3 is probably about 250. So you can go down here to the lower right and look at the X mean, it's 224. Um, this is a, the mean fluorescence intensity is a reflection of staining intensity, which can be a reflection of how much uh, the protein is expressed. So you can use this to see uh, low expression or moderate expression, that kind of stuff. So all we get is the percentages. Uh, so percentages obviously aren't very helpful. If you have a lymphocyte count of 100, the percentages can be completely normal, but you're severely, severely lymphopenic. So obviously we need a CBC with a lymphocyte count, and then we multiply the percentages by that to get the absolute numbers. Uh, so if you send flow to a lab, they typically either do CBCs, which we do not do, or ask for a CBC to send. So you'll see that on our order forms. Okay, um, I harp on this all the time because it happens all the time. Flow cytometry should never be your first test. <laughs> and I've had people, as example, I had a uh, kid that got sent to me with like no B cells. And I was like, what's going on? And my first question, of course, is does the kid have antibody levels? Well, they never sent an antibody level. So then I'm kind of wondering, well, what are they looking for? Um, I think in that case, the antibody levels are actually normal. So this is a kid that was sick and just had a uh, had low B cell count because of illness that resolved. So. It was an unnecessary test if you're looking for someone who's, for example, got agammaglobin anemia. You don't start with flow, you start with Ig levels. So remember that do not jump to flow, it's expensive and sometimes unnecessary. So um, very briefly, and I'm sure you've covered a lot of this, if you think somebody has a phagocyte defect, what do you, what do you look for? So kids with abscesses, uh, stomatitis, that kind of stuff, lymphadenitis. Um, delayed umbilical cord uh, 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 separation, all of that. So obviously the first thing you look for is a CBC. Are there neutrophils? Um, remember they can be low or absent, such as in Cosman's or congenital neutropenias. They can be low in malignancy, autoimmune neutropenia, cyclic neutropenia, or they can be high and be um, such as in leukocyte adhesion deficiency. Um, next test, uh, this is a flow-based test, but if you're looking for chronic granulomas disease, this is one where I, I don't have a problem going right to a, a DHR test simply because it's a very good test, so you would send that. You can, by flow, send uh, expression of adhesion molecules for LAD, um, that kind of stuff. And then there's a bunch of very advanced testing, which is sometimes controversial, but we won't get into that too much. So what are defects in phagocytes? This is your differential. I like to just think about things pathophysiologically. Your neutrophils and monocytes have to roll, bind, migrate toward a chemokine gradient, find the bacteria, phagocytosum, and kill them. And um, there can be defects in all this and all the way around here. Um, some organisms, remember some uh, bacteria like to hide in macrophage, uh, tuberculosis, for example. So this is where you need your T cells to get activated, expressing mainly interferon gamma to really uh, activate the phagocytes to kill the intracellular organism. So we just went through a lot of these, but these are all defects and phagocytes and defects and killing defects like CGD and IL-12 interferon gamma defects. So, and I'm sure this number is now tripled since we find new diseases every week.
Um, all right, so if you're thinking of a humoral defect, and this is uh, classically somebody with recurrent sinopulmonary infections, uh, the first thing you should always send is immunoglobulins and specific titers. You should not be jumping to flow cytometry. Um, and then there's a whole bunch more. So, for example, we can look at B cell uh, development by uh, looking for naive memory, switch memory B cells. We can look for transitional B cells, plasma cells, all kinds of stuff. And then more advanced testing like uh, mitogens and that kind of stuff. Um, there's quite a few things that cause low levels of antibodies and low B cell counts. The, we all know XLA and BTK are the most common, but uh, the mu chain, uh, IG alpha, um, lambda 5, blink, a number of these will give you low B cell counts as well. Um, and then combined immune deficiencies, when you're thinking of T and T or B combined immune deficiencies, this is the one instance where I'll say it's okay to order flow if you have a nine month old. Well, these days you have a kid who fails the skid screen, go ahead and send flow. <laughs> That's what we do, but in the old days, um, you had an eight-year-old with pneumonitis or disseminated CMV, you first thing you would look for is, is, is it skid, so you would have to do lymphocyte subsets uh, to be sure they're, uh, they don't have lymphopenia. As we all remember, all know, CBCs alone are not specific enough. Uh, for example, a T-minus skid be, can be missed just because if you have a very a large NK or B cell count, it can look somewhat normal. Typically, you'll get a hint, though, the lymphocyte count will be low normal or low. We always send Ig levels and vaccines. And then functional testing for T cell defects is more difficult. Some people do skin testing. This is difficult. Controls are difficult. It's not unusual to be abnormal. Um, and then there's a bunch of advanced testing, mitogen assays, antigen proliferation assays, cytokine production, NK killing assays, that kind of stuff. Um, just very quickly, obviously, there's some defects in uh, T cell help provided to B cells, such as CD4040 ligand. This gives you, um, this one gives you hyper IgM uh, deficient, uh, hyper IgM uh, syndrome. There are another, uh, lots of new immune deficiencies where you have defects in molecules that T cells and B cells communicate with that can cause a variety of immune deficiencies. And then, as we all know, you have SCID or the, the pure T cell defects, and these are all involved in T cell signaling. So defects in the TCR. Uh, gamma chain affecting growth factors, signaling molecules, et cetera. So, so that's a very quick um, summary of uh, differentials of immune deficiencies. So um, as I mentioned, routine testing should typically always done first. Don't send a DHR if you don't have neutrophils, so you got to have a CBC. Don't look at B cells if the Ig levels are normal. doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, but I, I did want to break down, I'm going to show some examples of uh, defects where flow cytometry is critically important and can really be diagnostic. And then I'll go into defects where it's somewhat supportive, but it, it, it kind of leaves you with, that's interesting, now what uh, kind of an answer. So um, first case, three-month-old. Obviously, this is not a three-month-old because he has teeth, but it was just an example of gingivitis. <laughs> It presents with recurrent fevers, skin lesions, can have stomatitis in the mouth. Um, uh, perhaps his uh, umbilical cord is a little late to fall off. Um, then had pneumonias. Uh, as I mentioned, the skin sores, gingivitis. Uh, skin ulcers that were low on pus. So when you hear a, a surgeon tell you there was no pus, listen to the surgeon. That's the one thing they can really help you because they know what pus is. If you already hear no pus, you should immediately think of, of course, the diagnosis. Um, anyone, CBC of 28,000? Oh, LED. LED. There you go. So this is a classic presentation of leukocyte adhesion deficiency, and this is how we diagnose it by flow. So leukocyte adhesion deficiency is, is broken down into um, LED1 and 2. LED1 is the uh, most well-known, and that's due to beta-2 integrin deficiency. That's the, the uh, CD designation is CD18. So we stain for uh, CD18 on cells. LED2 deficiency is a fucosylation defect. These kids are really rare. As far as I know, most of them are in Saudi Arabia. Um, but they also have other problems. They have developmental delays and other issues because obviously 
putting glucose on molecules is more important to other systems than just the immune system. But the one way you can do that is look for CD15 expression. CD15 is a fucosylated uh, 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 antigen, so staining is dependent on that. So we have mild antibodies for CD15. And there are a couple other ones uh, which you can't uh, quickly diagnose by flow cytometry, but they can look like glucoside adhesion efficiency. So you stain the cells. Now you're looking at your neutrophils. So you gate on these guys, and you look for CD18 expression and 15 expression. So in this case, we just did a histogram since it's one color. And you can see a normal patient will have expression of CD18 and CD15. Uh, LED1, you will see no CD18 but normal CD15 expression. LED2, you will see 18 but not 15. So this is a very, this is pretty much diagnostic. Um, if you have the right clinical scenario, obviously you, if you're talking about transplant, you may want to go look for, um, look for genetics, but that may not even be necessary if you have the right history in this kind of flow. Okay, three-year-old male with recurrent skin infections, uh, staph aureus pneumonia. He's always grown poor and on antibiotics. He has skin abscesses, um, pneumonia. He has these big lymphadenitis with lymph nodes. He's got a little bit of a high white count in the left shift, and he gets a lymph node biopsy, and you see this. But you know what that is? CGD. Yeah, it's a granuloma. So this would be very clear for chronic granulomatous disease. So um, I don't know. The trainees probably don't remember this test, but I remember doing it. <laughs> so, uh, And the old test was called Nature Blue Tetrazoleum, and basically you stain neutrophils with this dye uh, when you activate them, and then you get the reactive oxygen intermediates cause uh, reduction or oxidation. I can't remember which it is. Um, of the dye and then it changes color. So this was in the old days, you would look at the smear and you would see the neutrophils had blue spots in CGD. You don't see any blue spots. And then if you look at a mom who has excellent uh, care, who has a son with excellent CGD, because of lionization, half your neutrophils will be blue, half will not. You can imagine this is very time dependent, operator dependent, not easy, and takes hours if not days to complete. So we have developed a new one, uh, which is a test for a, with a dye called dihydrorhodamine. It's a super fast assay. I think it takes literally 15 minutes. You, you, you load the blood cells with dihydrorhodamine, uh, wash them, and then you activate them with, uh, uh, you activate the neutrophils to, to cause activation of the NADPH oxidase complex. And then the dye is reduced and you get a shift in fluorescent because the reduced dye fluoresces. So normally you have your unstimulated patients. Stimulated, you see a very broad shift. Um, here's a patient with CGD. You see uh, unstimulated and stimulated look no different. Uh, this is helpful because this would be more consistent with excellent uh, uh, CGD. Uh, I mentioned that how much it expresses is a marker of, of how much it's reduced. So, or how much it shifts, so the fluorescence intensity can tell you that. So in this case, there's no shift whatsoever. This is a bad case because um, when you can't make any reactive oxygen intermediates, you get no shift and they have the worst outcomes. Um, some of the autosomal recessives, you might get a little shift or kind of a moderate shift. You gotta be a little careful at the log scale. It can kind of fool you. Uh, the, as the amount they shift, it kind of correlates with their outcome. So, and that was shown by Steve Holland in a New England Journal paper. Um, so that can sometimes be informative. And then the other nice thing is you can study mom if it's a boy and very quickly, you can pretty much diagnose uh, uh, X-linked CGD by just testing mom because she will have some of her neutrophils won't shift and some will. So this is very fast. You get, you get 100,000 cells in 15 minutes and you can get very good data. So uh, this is chronic granulomas disease, and it's uh, deficient in one of the NADPH oxidase subunits. X-linked is the most common. Of course, there's three known autosomal recessives. Um, these patients, as we know, get catalase-positive bacterial infections. Um, I always like to highlight when you start seeing serration, ocardia, or a particular Burkhold area, you should immediately think of CGD. Um, I don't know of any immune deficiency that that is susceptible to Burkholderia uh, other than CGD. So when you see it, it's pretty much pathognomonic. 
Um, I like telling people, remember, CF patients get Burkle area, but it never leaves their lungs. So that tells you your immune system is very good at controlling this unless you don't have this, this pathway. And this just shows some of the findings of CGD, pneumonia, lymphadenitis, abscesses, sepsis, osteomyelitis, salmonella is a problem. And of course, they get colitis. This is a probably a, too, a low prediction. It's much higher than this. So, so one other thing we've, we've been able to find is um, we do a second activation with the dihydrorotamine. So the um, uh, PMA is called a four-ball ester, and it's a chemical that diffuses into the cell activates protein kinases, and then they go on and activate the NADPH oxidase system. So there's no physiologic signaling, no physiologic stimulation. So um, uh, we have used um, a more physiologic activator, which is f metlu -fi. f metlu -fi is a peptide. Uh, if you go all the way back to med school microbiology, you remember microbes, uh, bacteria don't use methionine. They use formulated methionine. So of course, our, we evolved to sense formulated methionine, so we have a receptor that binds it, and it activates the NADPH system. Um, now you'll notice, so this is a patient um, uh, that was, uh, this is a control, this is using PMA, you see a very broad, you see a very strong stimulation and response. And, and uh, when you use f met -Lufi as a stimulus, you get this kind of pattern. This is normal. It's just you're not going to get nearly as uh, broad a response uh, or strong as a response without the chemical. Why did we set this up? Um, well, we had a patient that was found way back when newborn screening was started uh, who had a neutrophil defect uh, who failed the newborn screen. Uh, and it was, a, it was a genetic mutation in RAC2. This involves uh, this kind of locks G protein signaling, so f met -Lufi, receptor signals through G protein, so this was a sensitive way to look for RAC2 function. And so we, this is a patient with RAC2 that had normal PMA but very little response to f met -Lufi. So we actually do both these stimuli uh, in our assay, although there's only two of these cases ever described, so we're probably wasting a lot of money on that. <laughs> okay, uh, third case, three-year-old male with a history of recurrent sinus pulmonary infections. Lots of otitis, three pneumonias, now has cellulitis, family history. Uh, uh, mom lost an, um, another male child at three years of age from sepsis, no one knew why. Exam, he has perlinasal drainage, conjunctivitis, ear infections, does not have tonsils or, or detectable lymph nodes. What is this? No tonsils, that should be a big giveaway. <laughs> Anyone? He has no immunoglobulin. So what do you want? You want antibodies, right? Antibodies are absent. So this is? Britain. There you go. So we actually can test this pretty quickly by flow. So um, we, can, we can stain for BTK uh, in B cells. Um, so this is a normal. Uh, this is CD19 staining. So we gate on the B cells, or we stain for B cells and for BTK. You can see the shift this way isn't great. BTK is not expressed super high in cells, but you can see it shifts. Um, and XLA, it's a bit of a problem, right? So how do you stain for a molecule that's expressed in B cells if there's no B cells? So you don't see anything here. Um, um, so you can't really stain for BTK in those cells, but we have a little trick, which is you can look in monocytes. Monocytes uh, express BTK. Um, and um, that's possibly why neutropenia is a common presentation in, in uh, XLA. The BTK probably has, has some function in, in uh, neutrophils as well. But we look at monocytes, so normally you see your CD14, you see staining. Here our patient has monocytes, they just don't stain for BTK. And then you can do the same thing with carriers. So uh, since it's X-linked, you look at mom, so she has, she has B cells and they sit stain for BTK. You notice there's no there very few B cells that don't stain. That's because uh, X-linked uh, or lionization, those cells don't survive. So if you look at the monocytes, you see two populations, some with BTK and some without, because that BTK is not required for monocyte survival. So this is a very rapid way to um, to uh, uh, find um, to find um, uh, BTK. Now, you got to be a little careful. We just had a family with two men 
two males, an uncle and a son with um, with AGAM, uh, or pretty low. They weren't complete AGAMs, but pretty low. Um, and we stained and it was normal. So, you know, one thing you always have to remember is expression doesn't mean function. So we sequenced and sure enough, they had a BTK mutation. It's never been, um, never been described before. So, uh, but it didn't ex affect expression. So we have to find a functional assay and the easiest way to do that is to, we're working on it would be to sort out mom's B cells and see if that, that DNA uh, mutation is expressed in the B cells. So those are things you can do, but usually uh, this will give you the diagnosis. So you guys said this, this is X-Link AGAM, this is Bruton's, uh, it's involved in uh, B cell development. So you see, a, you see a loss of B cells at the pre-B cell stage. They get lots of pyogenic infections with pneumococcus, H. flu staph. Uh, viral infections can be a problem, enterovirus in particular. Um, sometimes they can get almost like a dermatomyositis, like a myositis with rash that looks a little like dermatomyositis because of enterovirus. Um, when we used to use an activated polio, these kids could get paralytic polio. So you're, you do need antibodies for some viruses. Uh, they tend to get conjunctivitis, other stuff. And typically by flow, the B cells are very low or absent. Uh, they don't have to be, as I mentioned, there are a few cases where, um, actually the B cells have to be low, but the protein has to be expressed. But they're typically very low and antibodies are very low. Usually you see this in the first couple of years of life, but of course there's always exceptions. There's been 30 some year olds diagnosed with BTK. All right, uh, eight month old male presents with respiratory distress. Um, had lots of infections, paraflu, influenza, he has eosinophilia, abdominal pain, diarrhea, and then he comes in, um, this is a chest x-ray, he has a kind of a fluffy appearance throughout, this is pneumonitis, and they said this looked consistent with pneumocystis. Uh, interestingly, his stool grow, uh, grew cryptosporidium. So, let's see if I gave you, what do you want? You want some antibodies or something? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So this was his Ig and IgM levels. So obviously IgM, that's very high. IgG is low. So what do you think this is? Forty or yeah. Yeah. So hyper IgM would be high in your list, and we can actually study that as well. So um, so hyper IgM, this form of hyper IgM caused by is caused by mutations in CD40 and CD40 ligand. CD40 is expressed on B cells. CD40 ligand on T cells. CD40 ligand is X-linked. Um, 40 is autosomal recessive. Remember, CD40 is expressed on macrophage and monocytes, and probably plays a role in activating them, and that's why you get pneumocystis and cryptosporidium on top. So, and basically, we take cells, uh, we activate them with PMA and mycin, these nonspecific activators. We're just trying to show expression. And then uh, we stain for CD40 ligand. So here's your unactivated, activated, you see a shift. In the patient, you see no shift. In the mom, you should see uh, two peaks because of random act accident activation. Same thing, we published a paper a couple years ago, I think with the Seattle group um, of a child who had um, uh, hyper IgM and had normal expression but had a point mutation affecting interaction with CD40. So the binding of CD40, CD40 ligand to CD40 was absent. We had to do, we did that in Seattle with Troy Torgerson. So expression never means function, uh, but, if, but if you have no expression, then you can feel pretty good that this is CD40 ligand deficiency. So this is actually hyper IgM. Um, as I mentioned this, IgM numbers don't always have to be high. Sometimes they can just be normal. Uh, complications, uh, this is a horrible disease um, and you should be transplanted pretty quickly. Uh, one real problem is cryptosporidium, which can kill, once they get it, it's pretty horrible. Once it gets into the liver, there's not much you can do for it. But we treat it with uh, antibiotics, IVIG, and really bone marrow transplant is what most people would do for this. Okay, um, so those are some very clear instances where flow cytometry helps. Uh, here's one more. Um, so this is a two-week-old with low-grade fevers, hepatitis, plus one omegaly, 
There's his hepatitis inflamed. Uh, he's got a white count of 1.8 with 400 uh, neutrophils, hemoglobin is 7, and a platelet count of 76. He's not infected. Uh, what do you think of this one? He also has a paraspinomegaly. Any thoughts? And he got a bone marrow, and he, this is in the bone marrow. This is a uh, histiocyte, which is eating platelets, and this is one eating lymphocytes and red blood cells. So this is what? You're, fa you're phagocytizing hemo he hemocytes, so that's hemophagocytic. <laughs> And these are histiocytes, so this is hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis, or HLH, which is a defect in lymphocyte killing of infected, virally infected target cells. So we can actually do killing assays um, by flow. This is a functional assay. Um, so, uh, and basically what we do is we take NK cells, mix them with a tumor cell that does not express class one. Remember, our NK cells are very good at killing tumor cells and other virally infected cells that down-regulate class uh, MHC expression. That's the one way they try to hide. So our NKs have evolved to kill those cells. So it's very easy to just mix them together and the NK cells won't actually kill these. So in this test, all the cytotoxic machinery, so we take the, sorry, this is NK, this is another different cell line, but it's the same theory. Uh, you label the cells fluorescently so that you can separate them from your blood cells. You mix them together, you wait four hours, and then you stain with a dye that stains uh, double-stranded DNA. So that would mean that the cell membranes have been compromised because of apoptosis. So if you just put your target, you look at your target cells, you gate on them, you'll see we just use size here. Um, when cells die, they shrink and then intercalate uh, 7AAD. So this is an, uh, these are unactive, these are unmixed without tar uh, without NK cells and PBMCs. And then when you mix them, you see the cells shrink and they start intercalating dye. So we do a flow-based system for NK cytotoxicity. So NK killing is one of the diagnostic criteria for HLH. Um, I put this in red because uh, probably the most reason, most common reason this assay is abnormal is the child is sick. <laughs> so that's the problem. I see a lot of abnormal killing in people who are septic or bacteremic and, uh, or on steroids yeah. or something else. So it's always a tricky one. Uh, but it is one of the diagnostic criteria. I always do just kind of say, well, that was low, but I don't know what that really means. There is a better test, which is um, HLH's defects in the killing machinery. So you're, you're talking perforin was the first molecule, and then all the other ones, um, syntaxin, uh, MUNC13, RAB27, et cetera. So, but perforin is the most common, and this is the one where you can actually diagnose very quickly with flow cytometry. Um, the patient I showed you, um, I, I show this example because this is an unusual presentation at two weeks. These kids usually present older when they get CMV or EBV, but HLH has been described in utero. Um, and when I saw this case, I'm pretty sure I did what the rest of you said was, well, this sounds like an inborn error of metabolism affecting the, the uh, bone marrow and liver. And I, I just basically said, I don't know what this is. I don't think it's HLH. So, but I said, the only one I know that presents this early is perforin. So why don't we do a perforin stain? And this was the stain. So um, what we do is we stain intracellularly for perforin. We also look at granzymes and we, we gate on NK cells. Uh, NK cells naturally express perforin and granzymes because they're always ready to kill targets. So if you look at perforin and granzyme expression in NK cells, you'll see perforin expression, granzyme expression. So they're loaded up. Here's our patient. You see perforin, you see granzyme expression, but no perforin expression. So this is a very, I was very surprised by this. And I said, well, this kid doesn't express perforin. I guess it's HLH and we'll be able to start treating him immediately. So this is one that can be very helpful uh, when you have those instances. Otherwise, HLH has to be diagnosed by genetic testing, which can take a very long time, and, uh, or at least weeks, which when you have a kid who's very sick and needs immunosuppression, that can be a problem. So uh, briefly, HLH, uh, these are the diagnostic criteria, um, and uh, I won't repeat those, but uh, just highlight that use of that test. Okay, now I'm going to show you another test we do. Um, Another teaching point. So this is an eight-week-old with pneumonia, 
and, and then Paima, um, when they tapped her uh, uh, pleural fluid, she had a neutral count of 300,000, and it was floridly positive with pneumococcus and staph aureus. The ICU doctor called me and said, there's something wrong with this kid because she just doesn't look sick, and she should be much sicker. Um, so we do our basic workup. Everything was normal. Ig level normal, CBC normal, subsets normal, trek assay normal, CH50 normal. Couldn't find anything wrong with her. So uh, anyone know what the diagnosis would be? Particularly recurrent pneumococcal infections without high fevers. Thoughts? So this is a tricky one. This is a tricky one because the initial workup will be completely normal. It can fool you. Um, you have to order a special test and uh, the test we, we do for this is um, a toll-like receptor assay. I'll give that, this is IRAC4 deficiency almost. <laughs> I'll get to that in a minute. So IRAC4, MITE8 are, are TLR signaling molecules so you can't sense bacteria. Those patients always get pneumococcus and staph. Those are the big two uh, molecules. They can look incredibly well um, and not have fevers and not even look septic. We lost a child who would come in back to Rima five or six times and never had a fever, didn't look ill, got sent home, and then the culture came back positive. So I was pretty convinced this was going to be IRAC4 or MIT88. So one way to do this is a something called a toll-like receptor assay, which is basically, I'll show it here in the normal. We take blood, we stimulate it with LPS, which is a bacterial product, wait about four hours, and then we look in the monocytes and stain in intracellularly for t tumor necrosis factor alpha. Uh, that's made in very high levels in response to LPS, so you see a big shift. Here's our patient. This is the actual data. We did not see that shift. We saw a very poor, uh, kind of a poor shift here. Um, this would be very consistent with IRAC4. Um, LPS can go through other pathways and such, so a little bit of, a little bit of staining doesn't worry me too much. Um, this assay has been good for a number of uh, defects. Um, we've seen abnormalities in NEMO, for example, which you'd expect NF-kappa B uh, essential modifier. They have defects in this. We have a family of I-kappa B alphas that have kind of bad, uh, bad TNF induction. So we are very we are very convinced that this was IRAC4 deficiency. So just to review, remember these are all our Tolec receptors. These are all the agonists. We've evolved to sense all these conserved moieties on our microbes. So LPS binds CD14, binds TLR4, uh, signals through MITE88 and IRAC, uh, IRAC4, um, and then goes on to activate NF-kappa B and drive TNF-alpha TNF expression. So we put this child on IVIG, which interestingly helps uh, prophylactic antibiotics uh, sent genetic testing and had her come back and follow up in a month. So we repeated it and it was completely normal. <laughs> so <laughs> the point is, is that functional flow cytometry tests are sensitive to illness and uh, actually so are lymphocyte subpopulation. So I'm often telling people treat the infection, then call us and we'll do the flow uh, because you can get you can get burned by it. We did the genetic testing just to be sure and it was fine. So we think she was just unlucky at eight weeks old. So, um, but I show this is a this is exactly what you should see in an IRAC4 deficiency. But um, just to show that sometimes functional tests need to be repeated to be sure they weren't just uh, abnormal because of illness. Okay, um, I have a few more cases uh, where these things are helpful, but um, not usually diagnostic. Um, so, as I mentioned, a normal test is usually more helpful than an abnormal test. The TREK screening assay, as I'm sure you've learned already, uh, is abnormal in a lot of instances, such as prematurity, any type of illness, lymphocyte defects, gastroschisis. Um, these can be abnormal. Uh, and so I was just saying be careful when you act on lymphocyte subsets when someone is in the intensive care unit. I usually don't trust them until they're out of the intensive care unit. or they're older and they're not premature. So, uh, okay. So, here's a couple other instances where we use flow, where it helps us in the diagnosis, but is in no way uh, uh, diagnostic. So, a 13-year-old with ITP, 
um, had diffuse lymph, uh, lymphadenitis and uh, lymphadenopathy, splenomegaly, um, was given steroids, IVIG, splenectomy. Sorry, we did not splenectomize this patient. They were done elsewhere. I think we all know that splenectomies are never a good idea. <laughs> so when you hear this story of cytopenias and lymphoproliferation, uh, you should think about which diagnosis. Here's some labs. IgG was 3,000. Had a Coombs positive anemia. So this kid has pants. She has multiple autoimmune cytopenia, hypergammaglobinemia, lymphoproliferation. Anyone? Alps. Alps, there you go. So we can, um, one of the signs of Alps is an increase in double negative T cells. So um, you probably have always wondered what a double negative T cell is. So I'm, I'm going to show you. So um, for whatever reason in Alps, your T cells, which are defined by having the T cell receptor CD3, are lacking the co the um, the co-receptors either four or eight. So uh, CD3 positive, eight negative, four negative. So to do that, we actually double stain with four and eight with the same color because we don't care. We we just want them which ones are lacking uh, uh, both of these. And uh, so here's your here's your normal T cells, and these are and then we stain for T cell receptor on this axis. So these are your T cells that don't have your co-receptor, so these are double negative T cells. Normally, they're pretty low, less than 1%. Um, so in ALPS, you see a very high percentage of these, about 10%, for whatever reason. They also express an unusual molecule that's found on mouse B cells. Don't ask me why. It's called B220, and we use that to confirm. Um, so, however, um, uh, so ALPS, as I mentioned, is a defect in death, the death receptor, the fast, fast ligand system, which transmits death to patient, uh, signals to cells. Typically, get cytopenia, they get lymphoproliferation, hypergammaglobinemia. They have a high risk of malignancy and has to be filed for lymphoma. They have a high percentage of double negative T cells and high levels of B220 and CD27 on their cells. Um, however, be very careful. The double negative T cells are fine in all kinds of diseases. They're found in the George patients who have autoimmune cytopenias. They're typically not as high in ALPS, but they are, this is not diagnostic of anything. So you have to keep that in mind. All right. 25-year-old uh, female was healthy until about 20 and then started getting sinus infections, diarrhea, needed myringotomy tubes. It's just pretty unusual for a teenager. Um, sinus surgeries, kind of chronic diarrhea on exam has URI symptoms. Labs show a low IgA and a low IgG. Uh, stool demonstrates this. What are these guys? Giardia. Giardia, correct. So what is this diagnosis? You want some antibodies? Oh, I didn't give you the antibodies. I gave them already. What is this? Common variable. There you go. So this is CVID, which is not based on flow cytometry. It's based on low antibody levels and poor vaccine responses in the setting of recurrent infections. Um, however, the one flow test we do do for this, well, of course, we always look for B cells because sometimes a BT case slips through on you. Um, but other than this, we will look at B cell development. And, and the way we do this is look for um, the development of B cells from naive unswitched memory to switch memory. Remember, your B cells start off as IgD positive. IgM positive, but IgG and IgA negative. Um, so we use IgD. They get activated and turn on a memory marker called CD27. And then when T cells help them, they switch to IgD negative, CD27 positive. So these are unswitched and switched. Um, this, if you see defects, so for example, in CVID here, you may see very little memory cells. Or sometimes we see memory cells, they just can't switch, which is what you would also see in hyper IgM syndrome. So uh, we use this because patients who have this poor, this phenotype have kind of a poor prognosis with lots of lymphoproliferation uh, complications such as uh, enteropathy and, um, uh, and interstitial lung disease, GLILD, for example. So this is helpful a little bit in prognosis, but it is certainly not what we use for diagnosis. So. Okay, so that's CVID. We talked no titers, low antibodies. Um, the rest of flow isn't helpful. So most patients have T and B cells. 
some will have low T cells, some will have low B cells, uh, some will have T cell defects. It, it's all over the map. Um, but the, this, the flow cytometry is really kind of helpful more in determining uh, the development uh, stage of B cells. Um, the, the variability here is most likely, as we all know, CVID is a uh, conglomerate of probably 30 diagnoses. We've got about 10 or 15 of them now. So you're going to see all kinds of differences. So. All right, so this is my pet peeve, <laughs> even though we're probably one of the only places that does this test. So, um, this is a 10-year-old with recurrent boils that are MRSA negative, bad eczema, pneumonia with nematocele, scoliosis, rash at birth, has funny teeth that don't didn't come out normally. Mom needed her teeth extracted. She had infections. Um, this is an example of what they look like. So what is this? Repetition, repetition, RIG. Yep, so this is Job syndrome. So, um, so one of the original findings in Job syndrome or hyper IgE is a low percentage of um, TH17 cells. These patients also have problems with Tandida, for example, and fungal infections, which obviously you need TH17 for. So what do we do? We can just very simply take our cells, activate them with, uh, we use PMA again, something uh, pharmacologic to really activate them hard. And then we gate on CD4 cells and we stain for IL-17. And we take these cells, these are IL-17 expressing uh, T cells. And in those original papers, those are found to be low in hyper IgE. So this would be an example of hyper IgE. However, a, a big warning on this test is you guys are all allergists, so you send a lot of tests with people with eczema. These, this test is also low in eczema and people who are atopic, usually not as low as in hyper IgE. So, um, but that's a problem because you send it to rule out hyper IgE and, and a kid with eczema and um, allergies and it's low, that doesn't mean they have hyper IgE. Um, we see it low in a lot of other things. It's also developmental. Obviously, to make a TH17 cell, you have to educate your T cells so newborns can't express it. And so we don't take any samples before a year of age because we don't know if that's just developmental or an actual defect. So this is a functional assay that's a little tough to interpret. Um, if it's high, if it's normal, or like 2 or 3%, I think you can feel pretty good. It's not hyper IgE, but a low does not mean you have hyper IgE. We actually have a better test uh, to evaluate for this, which is a, um, a test that looks at suppression of uh, cytokine production by IL-10. IL-10 is STAT3 signaling is STAT3 dependent, so you can see a defect in IL-10 signaling of these patients. And that's what we use now. So. So uh, flow cytometry is a powerful tool in evaluating immune defects. Um, some assays are diagnostic. Uh, some are suggestive or supportive. Repeat abnormal assays if they're functional or even if they're abnormal, just to be sure. Uh, and uh, don't start with flow except for very few instances. Um, you should start with your basic workup and then go to flow. I think that's all I have. Thanks. Any Thank questions? You. Thank you. So I have a comment. Um, I'm glad you brought that up about the flow cytometry because we invariably will get consults where the general teams have ordered flow cytometry on everybody, um, and then they, they don't know what to do with the results, so then they come get us. So yeah, I wish, I wish we crazy. could have you give a lecture to the hospital and, and to, the whole, to all the staff of the hospital. <clears throat> yeah, it's particularly, I've, I don't know how many times there's been a kid who's septic. They send flow, and the... T cell counts are 250, the B cell counts 50, the NKs are 50, and they're like, is this skid? And I'm like, well, check in a week, and in a week it's totally normal. So I try to tell people all you're looking at is the cells circulating in the blood. Remember, the, the vast majority of your cells are in lymph tissue, and when you're sick, they're probably migrating into tissues to fight infection. So the fact that they're low in the blood does not mean they're low in the whole body. Um, my other anecdote for that is, remember, lupus, lymphopenia was a diagnostic criteria for lupus. They're certainly not lymphopenic. I mean, they're making plenty of lymphocytes causing a lot of problems. It's just they're not circulating and they're sitting in lymph nodes. So uh, I, I am always, uh, you know, we'll get consults on Saturdays and I'm like, well, it makes no sense to do, any, do anything this morning. You're treating the infection. 
we can't even do the fall to next week. So tell you what, why don't we do it when they're better and ready to get out of the hospital and then we'll do our consult. And that's typically what we end up recommending is we'll be back in a couple of days when you're treated and we'll, uh, we'll assess it. So we're, we're laughing on our end because we go through the same thing. And that's often is, you know, allergy, immunology, refuse the consultation. Yeah. <laughs> No, I said I'd be happy to do it in a couple days. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.